As scientists, we're trained to be cool and analytical in the way that we look at data and look at the natural world. This is really a situation that's rather gruesome. Watching these parasites develop within many bees, the effect they have on the bees, and just the whole process. So I discovered this by accident, coming into work one morning and noticing that bees were acting strangely in front of the biology building. I scooped them up in a vial and uh, took them down to feed a praying mantis that I had. I put them on my desk and forgot about them. When I came back uh, in a week or so and looked at it, that vial was filled with just a large number of these little brown fly pupae, and that's when I knew that those bees were parasitized. And that's when I started putting the two and two together to try and figure out why they were there and what was going on. The forehead fly that we're working with is uh, a creature called Apocephalus borealis. It's a very small fly, smaller than a fruit fly, and it's a, a native fly that normally parasitizes bumblebees and yellow jacket wasps, but it's changed over and now is parasitizing the non-native honeybee that came to us from Europe. We've nicknamed it the zombie fly because of the way in which honeybees react to being parasitized by it. The females fly around, they land on the bee's abdomen, and then they find the weak spots. There's a little membrane there. The female has an ovipositor. It's like a hypodermic needle. So what she does is to insert that ovipositor into the weak spot between their abdominal segment and start putting eggs into the bee. Then she leaves, the bee goes about its business for a while, those eggs hatch, and the little maggots, which are the larvae of those flies, start eating on the inside of the bee. About five days after the bee dies, two of our maggots start coming out of them. They come out what would be our neck, the junction between the head and the thorax of the bee. The larvae start pouring out in that area, crawl off, and eventually form little brown pupae. And then within that pupa, adult fly eventually forms. About three to four weeks, they emerge and they start that process over again, mating and looking for hosts. And as they start eating away, they begin to affect the behavior of the bee in really strange ways. The bees that are parasitized essentially get bee insomnia, and they leave their hives at night, which is a really bad time for honeybees to be leaving their hives. Bees that fly away at night basically are on a flight of the living dead. They're not coming back. And these bees, if there's a light nearby, are attracted to those lights. We find them sort of wandering around in circles, sort of in a zombie-like way. We don't know for sure that the parasite is actually causing the behavior change that we see in bees. It could be that it's controlling the, the physiology and the gene expression of the, the honeybee and causing it to do things that are, are good for the, the zombie fly. But it could also be that these bees are fleeing their hive to get away as great a distance as they can and make it less likely for their hive mates to be infected. It could also be that they're being uh, kicked out of the hive by their hive mates when they detect that they're acting strangely. Or it could be that you have a maggot eating on the inside of you to cause you to wake up in the middle of the night and go for a flight to try and deal with that uncomfortableness that's happening on the inside of you. Another question we're really interested in is whether the bees that are infected are just leaving the hives at night or whether they might be uh, leaving the hives during the daytime as well. Graduate student Chris Kwok, working with Andy Zink here at uh, San Francisco State, has devised a really ingenious way to answer that question. This system consists of a small hive, a radio frequency tracking system, and a flight cage. It's very difficult to tell bees apart. By assigning each bee a unique set of radio frequency or RF chips with a unique set of numbers, I can track exactly when they're entering and exiting the hive. I take a pair of bees out of the hive expose one of those bees to forward flies, have the other one set aside as a control that does not get exposed to forward flies, and then return them both to the hive at the same time. If I'm able to show that parasitism by forward flies directly leads to changes in daytime and nighttime behavior, that really establishes a direct cause and effect relationship. One of the big questions we're asking is how widespread is the phenomenon of forward flies infecting honeybees? So we've started a citizen science project that we're calling Zombie Watch. And Zombie Watch is a project that asks 
both regular citizens and beekeepers to be on the lookout for bees that are acting strangely. And we give instructions on our sites on how to isolate them, watch them, and see if any of the parasites come out of them, and then upload that information onto our citizen science webpage. We also provide a way for them to build a simple light trap that they can use to sample bees in their areas. This light then will attract honeybees that are out flying at night. You can come back in the morning and see what's there and let us know what you find. We live in difficult times for honeybees. They're experiencing all kinds of uh, new challenges from parasites and pathogens that are being moved around the world that affect them. And in addition, they now are, are dealing with this forward fly that's also causing mortality within the, the colony. So all of this is happening often simultaneously within a hive. And I think it's something that, that we all need to be aware of, the, the plight that bees are seeing these days. Bees indeed really are our friends. They're providing services for us that we really can't replace without them. Mm -hmm.